Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the Miller Center. And welcome to our continuing series on the historical presidency. My name is Will Hitchcock. I'm a professor of history here at the University of Virginia. And I also serve as the director of research and scholarship here at the Miller Center. As part of our ongoing investigation into the American presidency and the crises of the 19th century, we're privileged today to have two great historians on the stage. Elizabeth Varon is the Langborn Williams Professor of American History here at UVA. And she will facilitate this afternoon's conversation with our distinguished guest, H.W. Brands. Dr. Varon is the author of numerous books on 19th century American history, including, most recently, a new book called Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. And a plug, she will be speaking on that book here in this room on Wednesday next um, at 11 o'clock on November 13. Our guest today is H.W. Brands, who holds the Jack Blanton Senior Chair in History at the University of Texas at Austin, where he joined the faculty in 2005. He previously taught history at Texas A&M for 17 years. Professor Brands has written an astonishing 28 books. <laughs> he has co-authored or edited seven others and published dozens of articles and scores of reviews on many topics. His writings have received much critical and popular acclaim. Several have been New York Times and uh, 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 Washington Post bestsellers, his books have been. He was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for The First American, The Life and Times of Benjamin Franklin, and for Traitor to His Class, the Privileged Life and Radical Presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Professor Brands regularly writes for the national press. He's a frequent guest on radio and television programs. And simply put, he is one of the leading scholars of the history of the presidency in American life. It's a privilege to have him here today to discuss Andrew Jackson and the troubled birth of democracy. When he finishes his remarks, Dr. Varon will engage him in two or three or four large questions uh, just to get a, a few digs in early before the rest of you uh, take your shots at him. And then uh, we'll take uh, questions from the floor. Please uh, welcome with me uh, Professor H.W. Brands. Thank you, Will, for that very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be back at the Miller Center. And thank you all for coming. I'm a teacher. I teach at the University of Texas at Austin. And I flatter myself to think that I, my classes are kind of interesting. Um, but I know perfectly well that if the students didn't have to be there, a lot of them wouldn't be there. And I know that none of you have to be here. So I'm quite flattered that you took time out of your day to come. It, it really is an honor. Um, and the Miller Center is a great place to be talking about the presidency. I have been a consumer of what the Miller Center produces over the years, especially the oral history projects that they've been doing. And if you don't know, the Miller Center is the premier place in this country for creating and disseminating oral histories. These are the recollections of people involved in presidential administrations. I'm currently working on a biography of Ronald Reagan, and I have used several of the Miller Center's oral history interviews with members of the Reagan administration to, I hope, uh, good effect. At least I have learned a lot from them. I hope I can convey that to my readers. Anyway, I'm going to talk about Andrew Jackson. And uh, I think the subtitle is The Troubled Birth of American Democracy, or something like that. The general theme of the series, uh, and I gather some of you have been to previous installments in the series, is the crises of the presidency. And I'm going to suggest that there is sort of a permanent crisis of American democracy. And presidents find themselves right in the middle of it. I'm going to elaborate on that more general theme. But I'm going to talk in particular about the crises of the Jackson presidency. And the two I'm going to talk about are the nullification crisis, the question 
was the country going to break into pieces? Would South Carolina in particular secede in the early 1830s? That's the first crisis that I will deal with. The second one has to do with American monetary policy, the so-called bank war, the crisis between the president and the director of the Bank of the United States. So these are two, well, almost and uh, sort of knock down, drag out battles in the Jackson administration. And I think they go pretty far, if we look at them, in isolating, identifying critical issues regarding the Jackson presidency. But I'm going to suggest that they're actually much broader than that. They really go to the heart of trying to govern this country. I might say that they go so far as um, delineating the, the problems of governing any democracy uh, maybe that's a little bit too ambitious for today, but let's just say the democracy that we have under our particular constitution. But before I get to the crises, I, gotta, I have to talk a little bit about Andrew Jackson because, well, I guess I could say that Andrew Jackson treated life almost as a permanent crisis. Jackson was one who seemed to attract crises. And a lot of this had to do with his outlook on life. I've studied a number of presidents, and presidencies do not, what shall I say, perfectly reflect the tenet, that particular tenant of the White House, but there is a, a really strong connection. There are certain presidents who are combative, and not surprisingly, they tend to get into combat with Congress and with other people they deal with. Other presidents are rather more relaxed and they tend not to find themselves in the middle of crises. In this regard, I suppose, the presidency is a lot like life generally. I'm sure you know people, maybe you are a person who takes life as a combat, and you're probably, or that your friend, is always fighting with people. And then other people are just more relaxed. So the presidency is an institution, but the president is a person. And the person has a strong influence on how the presidency plays out, at least while that person is president. Anyway, Andrew Jackson had a difficult life. His father died before he was born. He was orphaned. His mother died when he was about 14 years old. Now, this was at a time when Andrew Jackson was already involved in the Revolutionary War. He was born in 1767. At the age of 13, he became a courier for the the American forces in the Carolinas, in the, the back country of the Carolinas. Now, for those of you who remember your American history, I have to be careful here. Um, one time I was trying to make a statement like this. I was speaking to a group um, of mostly retired people, and I'm looking around the room. I'm guessing a few of you may be retired, but it was a uh, continuing education program at the University of Texas. And the average age in the room, I, the, the folks there wouldn't have taken a miss if I had guessed that the average age was probably 70. So what I intended to say was, because I was talking about Benjamin Franklin, and I intended to say that you will remember that when Parliament passed the Stamp Act in 1765, <laughs> it raised a great ruckus. Um, well, I mean, actually, excuse me. What I, what I intended to say was you will remember from your study of American history, but I left out the study of American history. And one elderly gentleman in the back of the room, silver-haired, stood up right then in the middle of the lecture. And he said, young man, how old do you think we are? <laughs> anyway, so you may remember from your study of American history that the fighting in the American Revolutionary War was most bitter in the Carolina back country. And one of the striking things to remember about it is it was most bitter not between the Americans and the British between Americans and Americans, between the patriots and the loyalists. And Jackson found himself right in the middle of that. He was a young man. He was 13 years old, but he was very good on a horse. And I guess as a young man, the people who enlisted him into service felt that perhaps the British would lay off a kid. And so he was carrying messages to and fro. But in fact, within a few months, he was captured. And he was I have to think he was one of the, I'm not sure I should call him a soldier exactly, because he wasn't bearing arms, but he was certainly one of the youngest participants in the Revolutionary War at the age of 13. That's pretty young. And he was a prisoner of war by the time he was 14. And 
it was during this particular time that Jackson developed a particular way of thinking about the world, but especially about the British. He was a British prisoner of war. He was a young man. He, was, he had always been feisty. He was always skinny. He always had to sort of fight for everything that he got, for any kind of respect. And when a British officer came in and, in a very imperious tone, told Jackson to shine his boots, that is, the, the officer's boots, Jackson refused. So you can shine your own boots. And the officer, outraged that this kid should say this, and a, a rebel besides, took out his sword and took a swipe at Jackson's head. Now, Jackson was able to get his hand up to block the blow, but he cut his hand and it creased his skull. And for the rest of his life, Jackson bore a scar on his head and a slight dent in his skull. And he developed an abiding animosity toward the British. He never could believe that the British would do anything right, just, good, worthy, or anything. For Jackson, the British were the enemy, the constant enemy. It didn't matter if the United States was formally at war with Britain. The British were out to get the United States. And there are reports of Jackson at various times in his life when he was upset with somebody or other, not necessarily some British person, uh, but upset with somebody. It could be Henry Clay or John Calhoun or somebody like that. And involuntarily, his hand would go to his forehead <laughs> and he would feel that crease. And he could remember, I'm sure this wasn't, at this point it wasn't conscious, but he could sort of remember that the world is a dangerous place. And this is the important thing to remember about Jackson. To Jackson, the world was a dangerous place. Jackson went from his service in the Revolutionary War. He inherited some money when his mother died. Uh, but he quickly squandered that, gambling and racing horses. Uh, for want of anything better to do, he decided to become a lawyer. And so he read law, and this is in North Carolina, and he took the bar exam. It was a, an oral kind of exam. He took the bar exam, he passed. And he decided that there were probably already too many lawyers in North Carolina. So, at least in the eastern half of North Carolina, he decided that he would do what any number of people have done in the course of American history. He would go west because there were greater opportunities in the west. There weren't so many lawyers in the west. So he headed out to the west, to Nashville, which at the time was still part of North Carolina. It was the western part of North Carolina, but it would become a state. And Jackson would be one of the first people to be there. Now, getting out there was a task in itself, and travelers from the settled regions of North Carolina out to Nashville were well advised to wait until there was a critical mass of people going because travelers between North Carolina and Nashville were commonly subject to attack by Indians. And when Jackson gets to Nashville, it is still surrounded by Indians. And I won't go into sort of why there was constant warfare on the frontier between the Indians and the white settlers, but there was. Actually, one thing I will add to this is that it occurred to me when writing about Jackson that one of the ways to understand Jackson was as simply a chief of a different tribe. And the tribe was the Scots-Irish who settled on the frontier, who had felt themselves embattled in the various places they had been, including on the frontier. And so with Jackson, life was a struggle. Life was a battle. Life was a crisis, and the battle in his early years in Tennessee often consisted of defending the Nashville community against Indian raids and then taking preemptive raids you know, on behalf of the Nashville community. He fairly early on became the commander of the Tennessee militia in his district. And so he became the person most responsible for defending Tennessee, defending the women and children, the community of Nashville against Indians. It was a wild frontier. It was one where the casualties from Indian raids, and of course the other way around, Indian casualties from American raids, were a constant part of life. Very often people wouldn't go to the well without carrying a rifle with them for fear that they would be attacked. The reason I say all this is to try to recreate for you the mindset of somebody like Andrew Jackson because he became successful, but the success was a consequence of his willingness to look upon life as a struggle. 
he felt that life was a struggle, if he let down his guard, then danger, perhaps disaster, would ensue. And one of the reasons that Jackson became politically successful in Tennessee and eventually politically successful in the country is that his view of life resonated with all sorts of other people and especially with people on the frontier. Jackson will become, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, he became the first Westerner to become president, the first one who lived across the Appalachian, Allegheny Mountains, and he brought that Western view to Washington and to American policy, domestic policy and foreign policy. Jackson, I'll very briefly digress, and it's not really a digression, into Jackson's married life, because actually this is going to reinforce what I've just been saying. Jackson fell in love with Rachel Donaldson Roberts, and he found her attractive and she liked him. The problem was that she was already married to somebody else. But this other person, Lewis Roberts, um, was a very unreliable person. He would be gone for months at a time. He may have abused Rachel in one way or another. Uh, she certainly let Andrew Jackson believe that that was the case. And he was a boarder in her mother's house at a time when she had come back from where she was living with her husband because he had become intolerable. And so she came home. And something, some kind of sparks struck fairly quickly between Jackson and Rachel. But there was this question of, well, uh, where's her husband? And had he abandoned her? And the, the laws on divorce were much more stringent in those days than today. Now, today, Rachel simply would have filed for divorce, gotten a divorce, and that would have been that. But in those days, divorce was very difficult. The only way you could get a divorce was to get a special bill passed through the state legislature. So there was no general divorce law. And then there was the question of, well, does abandonment, does desertion um, meet the, the threshold, the requirement for divorce? And, and what happens if the person disappears and, and dies? You don't know if he's dead or not. So this question of what were Andrew Jackson and Rachel going to do? Well, in fact, chalk it up to young love, young passion or something, they basically decided that they would elope. And they headed off and they may or may not have gotten married in Spanish, Spanish-controlled Natchez along the Mississippi River. Uh, but when they came back, they sort of let out to the community that we are now husband and wife. Well, there was this question, well, what about your former husband? <laughs> and well, did he, had he gotten a divorce? Because there were stories that he had filed for divorce with the uh, Virginia legislature, because they had gotten married in Kentucky, which was then part of Virginia. But it was, it was a long way away, and they couldn't tell whether uh, the divorce had gone through. Now, as a matter of fact, they were not thinking that this was going to be a big deal, and it would not have become a big deal. I would not be talking about this. You would not have heard about this, except for the fact, or except for what none of them anticipated, that Andrew Jackson had become famous. At the time, he was a very obscure lawyer in the backwoods of the Western United States. And who cared, actually, except for maybe Roberts and a few other people? <laughs> well, in fact, so when he heard that Jackson had taken up with Rachel, he decided he wanted out of this wedding. And so he filed for divorce on grounds of adultery. And at which point, when the divorce finally came through, then Jackson and Rachel are faced with, okay, so what do we do about this? Now we know that you are actually divorced, and which, which suggests that the wedding ceremony, if any, and it's unclear that there actually was one, but the one we've been telling people there was, um, that that was invalid because, you know, if you're actually married to somebody else. So should we get married again? And Jackson stoutly resisted this because to do it would admit that they hadn't been legally married before. And initially he said, no, we're not going to do this. But finally, various people said, oh, you know, you really ought to do it. And he did. But he always thought that that was probably a bad idea because it really did cast a shadow over the first part of the relationship. Again, 
no one really would have cared much, except that Jackson became famous. And when he did, people had an incentive. If they wanted to get a rise out of Andrew Jackson, they would raise questions about, so who was it that you married and wasn't she married to somebody else? Well, people eventually discovered that you did this sort of thing to Jackson at your peril. <laughs> Andrew Jackson, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure about this part. Andrew Jackson is the only president of the United States ever to have killed a man in cold blood. I think he's the only president of the United States ever have, ever, to ever have killed a man with his own weapon. Now, it's possible that George Washington actually killed somebody, uh, had fired a, a gun. Uh, I know Theodore Roosevelt liked to brag that he had killed a Spanish soldier in Cuba during the War of 1898. I'm pretty sure he's wrong. I mean, if you read the letters there, uh, the first time he says, I shot at this fleeing Spaniard, I think I may have winged him. The second time he tells the story, I hit him. The third time he tells the story, and he went down dead. So anyway, but, so, and now the circumstances of killing a man in the cold blood is Charles Dickinson had gotten in a dispute with Jackson over a start over a horse race. But it escalated, and no one knows exactly what Dickinson said to cause Jackson to insist on having recompense. But there's strong reason to believe that Dickinson, who did this in part because he was trying to make a name for himself in the Nashville area, and no better way than to fight a duel with the leading citizen of Nashville. And he either gathered or somebody told him, you know, if you really want to get Jackson to go off, say something about Rachel. Well, it was said of Andrew Jackson that he was a person in whom you could see his rising temper when he was getting mad. And his face would flush, and he would start to talk loudly up to a certain point. But when he got really angry, then all of a sudden he would get deathly quiet. And apparently this is what happened when Dickinson crossed that line. Because all of a sudden Jackson gets really quiet. And Dickinson understood, uh-oh. So they had this duel. And dueling was illegal in Tennessee. So they went across the border into Kentucky, where it was actually illegal too, but nobody ever prosecuted there. <laughs> um, and this, by the way, this was just two years after the more famous duel of Hamilton and Burr, which of course was illegal in both the states where they were. But nonetheless, this was the way things were done. Now, I won't, give you the I won't give you the detailed story of the duel. I do with my students, especially. Occasionally, I speak to uh, elementary school or junior high school students. And the seventh graders, they're a tough crowd. They're a whole lot tougher than you. Um, you're an easy crowd because they all have to be there. And they're not interested in the stuff that happened ages ago. But once I start talking about the duel and I get people to play the different roles, oh, great fun. Anyway, so he kills this guy. Now, there were plenty of people who thought, this is appalling that a major public figure kills a man in a duel? Isn't that, didn't duels go out 100 years ago? But the thing is that there were plenty of people in America who thought that made Jackson all the more qualified to be, to lead something, be president of the United States. Because a lot of them would say, well, yeah, the guy insulted his wife. That's what I do too. Now, the reason I say this is to underscore this business of the combativeness of Jackson, but also Jackson's appeal to American voters. Now, for the most part, appeal to voters wouldn't, well, it wasn't that crucial when Jackson was a young man. Because, you know, as perhaps you know from your study of American history, <laughs> that early on in the American national period, the electors for president were not by and large chosen by popular vote. They were chosen by state legislatures. And so, one, a presidential candidate's popular appeal, that is for the people at large, was much less important than a presidential candidate's ability to connect with members of state legislatures. But during the Jacksonian era, and one of the reasons I wrote about Jackson was I wanted to see how democracy was born in this country. And you can follow a lot of it through the career of Andrew Jackson. Anyway, Jackson becomes nationally famous during the War of 1812. 
Jackson is really the sole genuine hero of the War of 1812, a war that for the most part was pretty disappointing from the American standpoint. It, it included various attempts to invade Canada and they didn't go anywhere. It ended with, well, the, the phrase was, on the basis of the status quo ante bellum, which basically means, ah, eh, forget it. So you have this war, Americans went in with high hopes they were gonna seize territory and smite the British and all this, and at the end just, eh. And the, as you will remember from your study of American history, the Battle of New Orleans, which was Jackson's finest hour, took place two weeks after the treaty was signed in Europe. Now, some people say, therefore, it should be simply a footnote to the war. I would suggest, actually, that it was more than that. Because what the British intended, ah, remember, Jackson has this thing that the British are out to get the United States. They he fought against them in the Revolutionary War. He fights against them in the War of 1812. And it, it's quite clear that their strategy in attacking the mouth of the Mississippi was that they were going to split American territory in two right up the line of the Mississippi. And they were going to create, if they could, some kind of friendly but non-American state in the western part of the Mississippi Valley. Perhaps it was going to be an alliance with various Indian tribes, um, but they were going to hem in, they were going to contain the United States. They were going to contain this infection of republicanism, just as, I would say, the United States tried to contain Soviet communism during the Cold War. And so you prevent America's growth and you can stop this noxious thing from spreading. Okay, so by defeating the British at New Orleans, Jackson prevented this happening. Now, one could say that, yeah, the war's over, it didn't really count. I'm not sure that that's actually the best interpretation because although the treaty had been signed, you will remember, in this case from your personal experience, <laughs> that the SALT II Treaty was signed but never ratified. Treaties don't take effect until they're ratified. And the treaty had not been ratified by either, the Treaty of Ghent had not been ratified by either side at the moment of the Battle of New Orleans. And had the British won, they would have plenty of incentive to just forget the treaty and continue with their offensive. Okay, but now something odd happens. The, it takes about three weeks for the news to get from Ghent in Belgium, what's going to become Belgium, to the east coast of the United States, to New York, to Washington, and so on. The Battle of New Orleans takes place two weeks after the signing of the treaty, and the news from New Orleans takes a little less than a week to get to these cities, New York and Washington. So Americans hear the news of the victory at New Orleans, Jackson's great victory, and then they hear shortly thereafter that the war is over. And it, you, you might infer cause and effect from here. We won at New Orleans, and Jackson's the great hero, and the war ends. The British, of course, had to quit after their smashing defeat at the hands of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson became the, I think it's fair to say, the most popular figure of his generation. He was the hero. In fact, he was often referred to as simply the hero. When I was writing about Jackson, I was trying to figure out if there was any way to quantify Jackson's popularity. And I knew perfectly well that there were no public opinion polls, you know, no public, you know, popular approval rating at that time, so that wouldn't work. I thought about, well, maybe I should read newspaper editorials and see if they're for or against Jackson. But then I thought, eh, that's not so good because this, in those days, sort of even more than today, I mean, way more than today, the newspapers were often simply organs of political parties. And their position on individuals were perfectly predictable from who, whichever party operated and funded the paper. So I thought, I'll let you decide whether this was a brainstorm or not. Um, I decided, okay, how can I measure the, the popularity, the, the fame of a, an American public figure? I happen to be flipping through an atlas. I thought, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the index of the atlas. I'm going to go to the back. And I'm going to count the number of entries for things that are named Jackson. So Lake Jackson, Mount Jackson, Jacksonville, Jackson City, and so on. And I'm going to compare that with the other popular place names. And you know what? At least in my atlas, there are more Jacksons than there are anybody else. The ones who come in close behind, can you guess who the other two are? Washington? Franklin, there we go. 
Washington and Franklin. And I would suggest that this even understates Jackson's popularity because Washington and Franklin had a whole generation's head start on Jackson. A lot of things that were already named. Now, I allow that there might be those odd places named for, I don't know, Stonewall Jackson, but just as there would be something named for some other Franklin, but anyway. So, but Jackson was this exceedingly popular, and I use the word popular advisedly because that's what I want to get at. He was, by the political classes, by the people who actually sort of thought they ran the country, Jackson was considered something of a wild man. He was this, well, they often use the term military chieftain. And, you know, we've been out there fighting the Indians, so he's kind of like a chieftain. But they talked about if Jackson should ever become president, this is sort of like Julius Caesar taking over or something like that. And it's fair to say that Jackson was the favorite of none of the, of neither of the political parties, at least at first and actually by this time. The Federalists are more or less fading away, so there's sort of a single party, and it's going to break up into two parties. One, which is going to be the Jacksonian faction, it's going to become the Democratic Party. But anyway, um, Jackson does some various things. He seizes Florida from the Spanish, in large part because he fears the British are using the Spanish as a cat's paw. Jackson is a real Anglophobe. He's got England on the brain. And if I get a chance, I'll tell you the last chapter of his life, which is all about fear of Britain. And maybe somebody better ask the question because I need to get to what I'm actually going to talk about. Okay, so Jackson gets elected president, but not on his first try. Jackson gets elected president on his second try. The first try was the election of 1824, in which Jackson polled the most popular votes. And by the way, 1824 is the first election where popular vote returns are generally recorded. If you look in your encyclopedia or whatever, you see the popular vote from 1789 to 1820, the popular votes aren't recorded. You're just the electoral vote. But in 1824, for the first time, you see the popular vote recorded. And Jackson got most of the, he got a majority, excuse me, he got the mo, more popular votes than any of the other major candidates. He did not get a majority of the electoral votes, so the race went to the House of Representatives, where his rivals ganged up on him, as he saw it. The number two finisher, John Quincy Adams, allied with the number four finisher, Henry Clay. Clay was Speaker of the House, and Clay managed to swing a majority in the House under the rules by which presidents are chosen, in those cases, to Quincy Adams. With the result that Jackson and his supporters believed that the result, the election of John Quincy Adams was illegitimate. This was a denial of the principle of, and first, I think maybe it's the first time I'm using the term democracy. This is the idea that people, ordinary people, can vote for president, not just state legislators, you know, not just the folks who are wealthy. I guess I should have added briefly that qualifications for voting are becoming less stringent especially starting in the West, but gravitating back toward the East. So more and more ordinary people can vote. Now, in fact, of course, this leaves out most African Americans and most women, but the idea that any adult white male can vote, that you don't have to be educated, you don't have to be rich, you don't, you had, don't have to have lived there for 10 years or something like that, the idea that ordinary people can actually exercise political power, this was the revolution of Jackson's generation. This was the birth of American democracy. And democracy was frustrated the first time when the old guard and the old system denied Jackson his presidency. If you think that political campaigns last a long time these days, the election campaign of 1828 began on Inauguration Day 1825 because the Jacksonians, I'll call them Jacksonians because they're not yet calling themselves Democrats, but they will, um, they believed that Quincy Adams had stolen the election. The, the term that they used was a corrupt bargain, and the bargain was, apparently, or at least tacitly, that Adams gets the presidency and Henry Clay gets the secretaryship of state, which in those days was the heir apparent to the presidency. So Clay pushes Adams to the presidency, thinking that he'll be the next one along. The Jacksonians go out and they start campaigning right away. The election campaign of 1828 was one of the most bitter, one of the dirtiest in American history. Duels were fought. If you think that politics is low and dirty today, when was the last time we had a duel? <laughs> now, really, we're just playing softball compared to what they played in the old days. And it gets even maybe worse than this. I mean, you can decide on this. In my opinion, the marriage of Andrew and Rachel Jackson is one of the great love stories 
in American history. There was this cloud over the origins of the marriage, but they were utterly devoted to each other. And it got a little bit difficult at times because, and perhaps you've seen this in relationships, Jackson became famous. Jackson became this great man. And Rachel remained the simple Tennessee girl that she had been. She didn't like politics. She didn't like fame. She liked nothing more than sitting in a rocking chair on her veranda, smoking her corncob pipe. Well, this was fine with Jackson. He thought she was the most beautiful, the most precious person in the world. But all sorts of people thought that, boy, what a hasty, what a rube. And they would make fun of Rachel's behind Jackson's back. They learned from the Charles Dickinson experiment. You had to do it behind his back. But they also recognized that once Jackson became a national figure, he really wasn't about to start dueling with people, although he wished that he could. Because in the election campaign of 1828, Jackson's opponents, the supporters of John Quincy Adams, they circulated all sorts of rumors, all sorts of stories, starting with the true ones about Rachel and the, the clouded nature of the, the marriage but all sorts of slanders and libels against Rachel to the point where Rachel suffered a nervous breakdown during the campaign. And she suffered a physical breakdown at the end of the campaign and she died. Between Jackson's election and what would be his inauguration, she died. Jackson was prostrate with grief. He threw himself down on the ground beside her grave in the rain um, in Nashville, the Hermitage outside of Nashville, and his friends had to bodily pick him up and take him inside and clean him off. He seriously thought about not even going to Washington, just resigning the presidency before being inaugurated. He didn't think he could carry on. He did say on a number of occasions that he knew he would never be happy again until he was reunited with Rachel in heaven. But he was eventually persuaded to go to Washington, if only to get his revenge on those people who had killed his darling. Okay, so this is the guy who becomes president at the beginning of 1829. Now, I promised sorry, I have two particular crises and how they played out. When Jackson became president, South Carolina was, always, was already agitating for a showdown over taxes. Now, the particular tax bill in question was called by, not by its supporters, you can imagine, the, the tariff of abominations. A tariff, for heaven's sakes. It's worth remembering, though, that tariffs in the 19th century were the chief form of taxes. There were no income taxes. So if people argue about taxes today, and they do, well, just translate that back into the 1920s. They were arguing about taxes, but they call them tariffs. But the deeper question was, who holds final sovereignty in the United States? Is it the national government, or is it the state governments. And I would point out to you that this is a question on which the framers of the Constitution decided not to take a stand, basically. They punted on this one. And they knew they had to because, well, uh, if they were going to get the states to give up their sovereignty to sign this treaty, and there were some skeptics among the states, they had to leave it kind of open-ended. Yeah, the Constitution does say that the statute of the country shall be the ultimate law of the land, but there still is this question, what if Congress passes a law that's unconstitutional? Because at that point, nobody quite knew what unconstitutional meant and who would decide these questions. Now, today, well, it goes to the Supreme Court. Well, questions like this had gone to the Supreme Court, although not the question of secession, or the term was nullification. Can a state refuse to enforce a federal law? within its own boundaries. That's what nullification was about. And in fact, distinguished opinion, starting with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, had said, yeah, the states can do this. Jackson took just the opposite view. Jackson considered himself a states' rights man. He believed that the states were more likely to make wise laws, make good decisions, than the federal government was. The closer government was to the people, the better the governance. That was his general philosophy. But Jackson drew a sharp line between states' rights and secession, or nullification, because secession was the obvious consequence of nullification. And he drew a sharp line. Why? Because he remembered, <laughs> as he stroked his head, 
that the British were out there and they were waiting to pick the American states off one by one. Jackson, I, I have to reiterate this, Jackson thought the world was a dangerous place. And that danger was something Jackson had felt personally. And as President of the United States, he felt it institutionally for the country. And he believed that secession, the separation of the states, would open the United States up to attack, threat, coercion by foreign powers, starting with the British. Now, Jackson believed that nullification was wrong, that secession was war against the United States. Things got rather difficult because the principal spokesman for secession was his vice president, John Calhoun. Now, Calhoun's role in fomenting or articulating the secessionist theory, the nullification theory, was not entirely known. But it was clear that the country had this administration where the president stood for holding the union together at all costs, and the vice president was taking the opposite idea. And there was a moment of great drama on the birthday of Thomas Jefferson. And uh, by this time, we're now in the early 1930s, they're calling themselves Democrats. But they're the, from the original Jeffersonian Republicans, you know, the name switches. Okay, and so even then, they held their Jefferson Day dinners to celebrate the founder of their party. And it was a moment when all the big wigs in the party would show up. And they would make toasts. And they would make points with their toasts. And sometimes the president showed up. Sometimes presidents didn't show up. But on this particular occasion, Jackson showed up. Now, Andrew Jackson was never an effective public speaker. He had a rather reedy voice. He often coughed. He was chronically sick from the time he was young. Sometimes he lived simply on tobacco and alcohol. But this time he showed up. And while the other great orators were there, including Calhoun, and, and they sort of this, of course, this was at a time when Americans appreciated oratory. It was one of the great indoor sports. Well, they heard that Jackson was going to be there. But Jackson didn't have a big voice, which, of course, made it all the more effective. Because when Jackson's turn came, he spoke in a low voice, and everybody had to listen very carefully. And he said, our federal union, it must be preserved. So he was throwing down the gauntlet to those who would say, you know what? The states put this country together. The states can take it apart if they want. When South Carolina persisted, saying that if the federal government tried to enforce that law, the tariff law, and if in the borders of South Carolina, South Carolina would exercise his right to secede from the Union. Jackson got his Secretary of War to draw up plans for an invasion of South Carolina. And he prepared to lead the invasion himself. At the moment of crisis, a congressman from South Carolina came to the White House. This was just before the, the winter break, and he was about to go back to South Carolina. And he dropped in. He said, Mr. President, do you have any message for my constituents? And Jackson said, yes, I do. Please tell my friends in South Carolina. Now here I'll point out. Exactly where Jackson was born is a little bit unclear. It was somewhere on the border between North and South Carolina. He played it for greatest effect uh, whenever he wanted to. So at this point, he was speaking as a South Carolinian. He said, please tell my friends in South Carolina that if a single drop of blood is shed against the United States, I will hang the first person I find from the highest tree in the state. Now, the South Carolina congressman took the message back to South Carolina. And when Andrew Jackson threatened physical harm against people, given his record with Charles Dickinson, <laughs> people took it seriously. And in fact, the crisis passed. South Carolina withdrew its demands. Now, Jackson was a sufficiently astute politician to allow South Carolina a face-saving out. But he made very clear that you can debate issues of taxes, of governance, but the debate has to stop short of the point where you say, we are leaving this union. Okay, 
This is in the beginning, the end of 1832, the beginning of 1833. Now, Jackson, in kind of accepting the victory, commented, he understood this issue hasn't gone away. But he said, the next time it's going to be over the slavery question, which, of course, is how things turned out. Okay. But actually, it does raise an interesting issue. What if Andrew Jackson had been president in 1861? Would southern states have had the nerve to go out? Jackson made very clear before South Carolina passed any ordinance of secession, this means war, and you're going to bear the brunt of it. Now, one of the effects of this was to deter the secessionist movement in South Carolina, perhaps even more important, to scare away any other southern states from perhaps joining South Carolina. Suppose Abraham Lincoln had taken that strong position. That's actually too much of a supposition, because Abraham Lincoln, as far as we know, had not killed anybody. And anyway, but it is, it is interesting to, to keep in mind. Okay, the second crisis. Um, the second crisis has to do with the Bank of the United States, but it's a broader issue than that. And it requires you to do something that, well, I think you have to do if you want to understand history as it was lived. You know, one of the things uh, we use to examine history is we use the advantage of hindsight. We know how things turned out, and therefore we know what to look for when we go in the past. I'm going to suggest to you, however, that if you really, ought to, if you really want to understand how the world looked to the people who were living it, you have to abandon hindsight. You have to forget everything that happened after that moment in time that you're looking at. Because, of course, the people that you're studying didn't know how things were going to turn out. And I'm going to actually raise it on two points right now. We know that American democracy survived. Here in the year 2013, the United States is a functioning democracy. We can debate over how well it's functioning, but we do hold elections and people vote and all of this stuff. And it's tempting, knowing how things turned out, to think that, well, that was kind of inevitable and it was going to happen. Well, maybe that's so, although actually I'm going to say it wasn't inevitable at all. In fact, I'm going to say it even didn't happen. I'm going to say that American democracy actually crashed during the Civil War. But we'll get to that. I mean, because, you know, uh, if democracy is about anything, it's about resolving our issues at the ballot box, not on the battlefield. If you have a civil war, whatever system you've had, fail. But leave that aside. Jackson didn't know that democracy was going to survive. He had seen the opponents of democracy steal one election, they might steal the next one. And given Jackson's attitude toward the world, that it's a dangerous place, that there are people out there who wish us ill and will do us harm at first opportunity. He believed that democracy was something that had to be defended at every turn. This was his attitude toward the nullification crisis. We can't just take a relaxed view of this. The existence of this country, the existence of democracy is at stake. Okay, now on the Bank of the United States question. The Bank of the United States was uh, kind of a private forerunner of the Federal Reserve. And it tried to answer a perennial question in American economic and fiscal and monetary policy. And that is, what is money? Who makes money? Who determines how much there will be? Who determines its value? The issue, of course, has not gone away. As anybody who's been following the debate over Ben Bernanke and his handling of the Fed and the quantitative easing, the expansion of the money supply and all this stuff. It is a complicated issue that is always with us. In the early 19th century, well, first in the late 18th century, Congress decided to hand it over to, well, a private version of a central bank. It was called the Bank of the United States. And it was a bank that had a privileged position with respect to American federal deposits and the like. And it essentially set monetary policy. And in means, in ways not unlike the way the Fed does it today. But it was stoutly resisted by people who thought, wait a minute, money is too important to be handed over to private interests. Because everybody depends on money. Everybody is affected by the quantity of money, value of money, and so on. In a democracy, this is a decision that ought to be made by the representatives of the people, not the representatives of the rich, because everybody needs money. So the first bank of the United States was chartered 
And it ran out, it started in 8, 1791, it lasted until 1811. And it was chartered by the Federalists, it was allowed to lapse under the Republicans. They soon changed their mind, the War of 1812 came along and it turned out that a central bank is pretty handy to have during wartime. And so the Madison and Monroe administration decided, okay, maybe we should have another Bank of the United States. So they rechartered it and they got the second version. And the second version of the Bank of the United States was chartered in 1816 and it was on a 20 year run. In those days, corporate charters were not open ended. Uh, corporations were chartered for 20 years or so, kind of like well, you know, a charter is in some ways a special license. So it's a little bit akin to a monopoly. And just like monopolies, just like patents, uh, they run out. At least that was the feeling then. So the Bank of the United States was chartered from uh, 1816. It's going to run until 1836. And it was something that actually came to the attention of the Supreme Court. And in the 1890 case, 1819 case of McCulloch versus Maryland, John Marshall, one could call him the last of the Federalists, said that the Bank of the United States is perfectly constitutional. And that seemed to settle the issue until Andrew Jackson became president. And Jackson took a view that is going to sound very odd, quite foreign to us, but in fact was rather unremarkable at the time. And that is that the Supreme Court, in its decisions, speaks for the judicial branch of government. It does not speak for the legislative branch, and it certainly does not speak for the executive branch. And so Jackson could wave aside the fact that the Supreme Court had ruled the Bank of the United States constitutional. He said it's unconstitutional. And this wasn't the only issue on which Jackson differed with John Marshall, and it wasn't the only one in which he adopted this view that the Supreme Court rules for the judicial branch, but the whole reason we have separate branches is so that we get the different views and different intelligence of different people. So the bank became the focus of the election campaign of 1832. Henry Clay wanted to ride the issue of the Bank of the United States into the White House. Henry Clay, by the way, is one of two, two individuals, two individuals, who holds the distinction of having achieved the nomination of a major party for president three times and never won once. Henry Clay has won. Do you know who the other one was? William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan. Very good. Yes. Which is kind of interesting if you think about it because you have to be pretty popular to get nominated three times, but just unpopular enough not to get elected. Anyway, so Henry Clay collaborated with the director of the Bank of the United States, Nicholas Biddle, to apply to Congress for early renewal of the Bank of the United States, thinking that this would force Jackson's hand. Jackson would either have to succumb and approve the renewal, or conceivably he could veto the renewal of the bank's charter, but of course that would derange American business, make Jackson very unpopular, and Henry Clay would waltz into the White House. This was the plan. So the bank charter was renewed, and Jackson took this as an affront. He said, okay, you can renew this, but it's still unconstitutional. Now, Jackson's view of banks and bankers was fairly characteristic of a lot of people in the United States, call it the populist wing of the American polity. And I'm going to suggest to you that some of this strain still lives. In that, when Jackson looked at banks and bankers, he could see that they were rich and they made a lot of money off of transactions that were necessary in the lives of ordinary people, but he couldn't see that they actually did anything worthwhile. So what did they do? They're simply money changers and they take their cut. You know, Wall Street and the financial industry in the United States has even very recently, come in for similar kind of criticism. What's all this derivative trading? You know, who, gets, who gets any benefit out of this besides the bankers? Well, that was the Jacksonian view. So Jackson believed, well, I, I said that he was a states' rights man in politics. You could call him a states' rights man in banking as well. He thought that the Bank of the United States, holding this favored position in the nation as a whole, had an unfair advantage over the state banks. So, against the advice of many of his top counsel, 
certainly against the expectations of Henry Clay and Nicholas Biddle, and probably against the opinion of most American business vetoed the bank charter. And Henry Clay thought, this is it, I'm going to win. Jackson had a better sense of what American opinion felt about banks. And he carried his reelection campaign easily. At which point, well, Henry Clay was distraught. He didn't know what he was going to do. Nicholas Biddle was outraged. Nicholas Biddle believed that he knew better what was good for Americans, for the American economy, than that Yahoo Andrew Jackson did, or than pretty much anybody else did. Now, I'm just going to point out that he was probably right. But to Jackson, that was immaterial. Jackson, of course, didn't believe that was right. Um, and so Jackson decides that he is, since the bank is going to be winding down anyway, and since Nicholas Biddle, here was Jackson's problem with Biddle and a big central bank, was there was too much power in the hands of an unelected official. This is the age of democracy, Jackson said. Ordinary people should have as much control as possible over their own lives. And there's this one guy, Nicholas Biddle, and nobody elected, who can cause prices to go up, cause prices to go down. This is intolerable in a democracy. And in fact, Nicholas Biddle proved Jackson right. He tried to demonstrate the importance of the Bank of the United States by artificially engineering a financial panic, which caused interest rates to rise, which caused businessmen who needed to borrow money to go to Nicholas Biddle and said, Mr. Biddle, you know, you, we need the money. He said, don't blame me. Go to the White House. So they went to the White House and said, Mr. President, you must relent. You must come up with some kind of deal. And Jackson said, don't come to me. Go to the man who has the money. Go to that monster. Jackson believed that Nicholas Biddle was declaring war on him, Andrew Jackson, and because he was the elected president of the United States, declaring war on the American people. And he turned to his vice president. He said, Mr. Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And he did. Jackson removed the federal deposits from the Bank of the United States. This was the lifeblood of the Bank of the United States. And the bank quickly slid into irrelevance. Its charter ran out in 1836, and that was the end of it. And it was a great triumph for democracy. The elected officials of the United States, the elected president of the United States, had triumphed over the unelected banker. It was a triumph for democracy, and it was a disaster for the economy. The, the termination of the Bank of the United States led to vast speculation funded by state banks in Western lands. The bubble burst. What followed was the Panic of 1837, the most serious panic in American history before the Civil War. Now, the lesson of this, that's, I'm getting to the end. The lesson is, <laughs> well, in the case of Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson never repented. He felt that he had done the right thing. Um, by the time the panic hit, he was out of office, and it was somebody else's problem. But he still believed that there was a principle worth fighting for. And if it was a principle worth fighting for, he wasn't going to back down. But it does kind of raise a couple of issues. And I'll start with the one about whether this triumph of democracy was good for the United States. And it's a kind of a deep question. Uh, well, the, the subtitle of my talk is The Troubled Birth of American Democracy. And I suggested instead that it could be sort of the permanent crisis of American democracy. And it has to do with these two issues that are exemplified by these two particular crises. So there's the one about nullification. Well, ever since the Civil War, no state, with the exception of the one that I live in, Texas, has ever really spoken, and even in Texas, the so-called secessionist movement in Texas, is nobody takes it seriously. My, the governor of my state, Rick Perry, uh, occasionally sort of talks out of one side of his mouth saying that, you know, that's the right idea, but no. Nobody's going to do it. So the Civil War settled the issue, I think. I mean, I actually raised this question. I'll raise it to you. You think it's settled forever. The Civil War settled the question of whether you can leave the Union. But it didn't settle the question of when you have a two-tiered system of democracy, where you have some decisions that are made at the national level and other decisions that are made at the state level, what do you do when push comes to shove? What do you do, for example, if, I don't know, just to pick something out of the blue, 
The Congress passes and the President signs, I don't know, the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> and a bunch of states, including the state that I live in, Texas, and we don't like this. We think it's a terrible idea. And they do whatever they can to sandbag it, to opt out of it. So what do we do? Well, in fact, what we do now is we resort to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that in certain parts of the law, the states can opt out. But we still have not resolved this issue of how do you run a country when there are two levels that are often at odds with each other. And this is, this is a problem that's not going to go away as long as we have this federal system. Now, I'm not saying we should undo the federal system, but I just think it's important to be aware that every system has its drawbacks. Then the other issue, the one about, well, the Bank of the United States and whether the triumph for Jackson's democracy um, and the disaster for the economy. Well, what do we do about this? The fact that we have democracy is based on the idea that, generally speaking, the majority, with things carved out for minority rights, but generally speaking, the majority gets things right. But do you believe that that's always the case? Generally the case? Sometimes never the case. What do you do? I mean, this is going to become an issue, for example, after the Civil War. What do you do when a majority supports a policy that is, we could just we'll call it various things, wrong, immoral, unethical, criminal? Is democracy, the fact that you know, we let people vote, is this any guarantee of good government? I mean, it's popular government, but is it good government? And I mean, I'm not going to weigh in on this. I, I guess I'll close. I don't want to leave you with a, on a down note. But I will close by citing Winston Churchill on the subject. You know, you know what Churchill said about democracy. And you will remember this maybe from your study of history. Some of you maybe from, maybe you heard it. And he said that democracy is the worst form of government there is, except for everything else that's been tried. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll get the question and answer period started now. I have some things I'd like to ask. And the first is, so we have Jackson as a feisty man, a belligerent man, a man who's always in crisis mode. So who did he trust? Did he trust anyone? Who were his right-hand men, his confidants? And I ask, as an invitation in part, to ask you to say a little bit more about someone you mentioned in passing, Van Buren, who's really kind of at the heart of all this stuff, who occasionally maneuvers himself into the heir apparent slot. They're sort of, you know, an odd couple. So tell us a little bit about ja Jackson's inner circle and the people who I'm worked glad you with him. I used that. Uh, I guess it was an adverb, cagely, yeah. with Van Buren, because one thing that Andrew Jackson was not was cagey. Uh, one thing Andrew uh, Martin Van Buren was was cagey, and what what this meant was that Jackson's style of leadership was good for certain things and bad for other things. Jackson's style of leadership was really good at war, really good when there was an actual crisis, when you could mobilize passion, when you could mobilize the country in defense of clear national interests. So Jackson, was a, Jackson became this hero because he was able to defeat the British at New Orleans. And nobody objected to that outcome. And some people had objected to the style that he used to put the army together and to hold the army together. It was a very difficult place to defend. But anyway, um, in that arena, in fact, I said that Jackson was always in crisis mode. Yeah, when there really was a crisis, Jackson's leadership style was good. But on other occasions, it wasn't so good. Because life, in fact, is not a perpetual crisis, despite what Andrew Jackson thought. Jackson tended to rely on people he had known for a long time. And very often, people that he had known during, well, I'll call them real crises, people that had fought on his side. His Secretary of War, John Eaton, was one that he brought on board because he had known him. He served with him in Tennessee. And he trusted him. Now, Jackson demonstrated something that is a failing. I'm going to call it a failing of presidents um, who 
become president for something other than their skill at politics per se. Ja Jackson carried his personal code of loyalty with him to the White House so that when, and I've written recently about Ulysses Grant, had exactly the same problem. People who served with Grant during the Civil War and who served faithfully and well, Grant thought, well, they'll serve well and faithfully in peacetime, and he'll give him positions in the White House. Well, in Jackson's case, ah, and then there's also the memory of Rachel. So John Eaton was married to a woman, Peggy Eaton, Peg Eaton, who had something of a, well, a checkered background in Washington society. She had grown up in a tavern. Her father was a tavern owner. And to a lot of people, that was equivalent to, well, at an earlier time, and even then, um, saying that somebody grew up in a tavern like was, was like saying a woman was an actress, <laughs> which was often a, an ill-disguised synonym for a prostitute. So the, the wives of several of Jackson's cabinet members refused to associate with Peg Eaton. If she was invited to a reception or a dinner, they wouldn't come or they would get up and leave. Now, if Jackson had been a better politician, if he had been as cagey as Martin Van Buren, he would have realized that this was a serious problem and he could not do the business of the country, the business that he was elected to do, with his cabinet paralyzed by this refusal of the women to sit down with each other. And their husbands sort of honored their wives' requests. And, and his cabinet was at a standstill. Now, if Jackson had been cagier, he would have taken Eaton aside and said, look, this isn't anything personal. It's simply politics. But you got to go and take your wife with you. <laughs> now, but Jackson wouldn't do that. Because Jackson, having experienced and observed the nasty things that were said about Rachel, could never get himself to believe anything ill about any woman. And now you could call this very gallant in Jackson, and I think it is, if you are a private citizen. But it's not particularly advisable if you're president. And I would go so far as to say that successful presidents understand that there is one moral code for personal behavior and a different moral code if you are the leader of a great nation. And I'll just sort of draw the, maybe the extreme example that I think would demonstrate this. If you want to be a pacifist, if you take the philosophical position that you will return, you will not return violence with violence. If you are attacked, you will simply accept the attack. You will turn the other cheek. That's fine if you're the only one involved. But if you're a pacifist, you have no business running for president of the United States because you are charged with defending, these days, 300 million people. And there are bad people in the world out there who, if you are not prepared to use force to defend Americans, they might do bad things to Americans. So Jackson did not understand, or at least didn't honor, this distinction between leadership in one context and leadership in another. And as a result, his management of the White House was well, he thought it was quite honorable, but it was far less effective than it might have been had he been a bit cagier, a bit more like Martin Van Buren. Well, let's talk a little bit about Jackson's nemesis, Henry Clay. You mentioned Clay in the context of the bank war. And we had a scholar here a few weeks ago in our last uh, talk in this series, Daniel Walker Howe who had, would argue that we should think of this period we've been discussing not as the age of Jackson, but as the age of Clay, that the Whig Party uh, were really the, the party that had left more of a stamp on modern-day America, the heralds of tolerance and modern industrial capitalism and big government and so on. So talk to us a little bit about Clay. These men loathed each other, Jackson and Clay. What, do, what does Clay represent? And, and what would you say to, uh, in, in answer to the idea that we should think of this as the age of Clay and not of Jackson? I would say that if we are talking about substance, that is probably a fair characterization. If you want to know what the policy of the country, how the institutions of America, how the values of America evolved, Clay might be the better guide. Because the world that evolved in the late 19th century, in some ways the world we live in today, is the world of Henry Clay. So that part's definitely true. But politics is about more than substance. It's also, it's also about symbols and symbolism. And I was struck, I was working on the Jackson book 
during the presidential election of 2000. And I remember one of the debates between George W. Bush and Al Gore. And it was really interesting to me because I've just been reading about and writing about this period when popularity in presidential candidates was all important. And here were these two guys up on the stage who between them had three Ivy League degrees. And they were knocking themselves out to demonstrate that they were just folks. You know, ordinary people, they had the common touch. And I asked myself, where did this come from? It came directly from Andrew Jackson. Because Andrew Jackson demonstrated that if you are going to let ordinary people vote, you have to touch the emotions of ordinary people. Yeah, well-educated people, people who are very observant and aware, they vote on the issues. And that's true. But even people who vote on the issues are moved by temperament, moved by style, moved by an assessment of what kind of person is this. And this isn't simply uh, kind of fog and hot air. Remember that the President of the United States is, well, the closest thing we have to head of government, although it's a divided government, but he is the head of state. And he is the one who has to summarize, articulate, the emotions of the country. When bad things happen, he's the consoler in chief. When good things happen, he's the celebrator in chief. And for a long time, I've thought, and in fact, I think that Al Gore and George, George W. Bush bought into this in 2000, they realized that what you wanted to do in voters' minds was to create the impression that between me and my opponent, I'm the one you'd rather have a beer with. And that's pure Jackson. That goes back to Jackson. So we historians are always waffling, yeah, this and that. But I think this, that's a very good point, because in terms of policies, in terms of substance, uh, you can say that Clay was the one. In fact, I'll elaborate just a little bit more. I mean, as is well known, um, and in your case, by your study of American history, none of you are this old, um, you know, the center of gravity of American politics during the 19th century was not usually at the White House. It was usually in Congress. And that's the way the framers of the Constitution intended and expected that it would be. The president is called the chief executive. He exec executes the will of Congress. Only rarely did a president rise to the level where he outshone, for a moment, the members of Congress. And so, you know, the great triumvirate, as you suggested, of Henry Clay and Calhoun and Daniel Webster, from the 1830s to the early 1850s, these were sort of the, these were the political heavyweights. You'd get somebody like Jackson, but Jackson was often seen as this symbolic figure who could, a lot of people thought he stepped way out of line and beyond his authority in vetoing the, the bank bill. And then you'd get an Abraham Lincoln when war came and you needed a chief executive. But with the except, really quick, if I asked you, how many 19th century presidents can you name except Jackson, Lincoln? You know, you'd, you know, if you ran through the list, you'd have to think, I think, fairly hard, because a lot of them are quite unmemorable. Um, so I think that's a, a very good characterization of the period. Let, I'll ask one more question, and we'd love to hear from the audience. And this is a question about uh, your chosen genre. So you are telling American history through a series of biographies. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the challenges and opportunities, perhaps the pitfalls of biography. The general public loves biographies. Academic historians are sometimes uh, a little uh, dismissive of them. I, I, I wrote one biography, and I had people say to me, oh, biography is fun. It's easy which I don't think is true at all. But uh, I want to uh, hear you talk a little bit about that. why that choice of genre for you. What, what, what OK, I will share with you an experience that I had starting about 20 years ago now. I had this idea as a relatively young professor that I wanted to write a history of the United States. <laughs> now, I realize this was a little bit broader than most people in the academic world take their area of interest. But I wanted to do it, um, in part because I, had, I, I taught high school for 10 years before I started teaching in college. And I have long thought, and I still teach an introductory survey of American history. So this semester, I have 488 students. And we are, let's see, we just finished the War of 1812, and we're, we're going to get to the Missouri Compromise soon. Okay, And we're going to go up to the Civil War. And in the spring, I'll take them from the Civil War to the present. And I have long thought that it is great intellectual, intellectual exercise for a historian to have to summarize, to have to, I get one lecture, 75 minutes to explain the Civil War. 
<laughs> now, needless to say, people spend entire careers on the Civil War. But that's just all I get. Because most of these students are not history majors. They're taking the course because they're required to take the course. The Texas State Legislature, in one of its moments of inspiration, <laughs> uh, has decreed that all students at Texas public universities have to take two semesters of American history. So these are my students. And I have to decide, OK, if I've got 75 minutes to talk about the Civil War, what do I talk about? If I have 75 minutes to talk about the writing of the Constitution, if there is a kind of intellectual, or I'll call it authorial discipline, you have to decide this is more important than that. Because you can't tell everything, so you, you make your choice. And so I, I like this idea. I've been lecturing on American history. I also was really intrigued because most textbooks are team written. And so you get four, six people, authors. And often they're very good, but they read like something produced by a committee. So you kind of get in the rhythm of one of the authors. And all of a sudden, whoop, we get to the section that's uh, top, uh, written by somebody else. And there's a little bit of a jolt there. So I thought, well, how about one person writing the whole thing? Hey, how about me? <laughs> so, so I proposed this idea to a publisher. And now, when you hear the publisher's response and I see your reaction, I will be able to gauge how old you are. <laughs> so I told the publisher I wanted to write this multi-volume history of the United States. And he looked at me. And he said, come on, nobody does that thing anymore. Who do you think you are anyway? Will Durant? <laughs> OK, see, people laugh. You know who Will Durant is, was. Um, and I said, well, actually, I wanted to say, I'd like to be. But it was clear that wasn't the answer he was hoping for. This was a rhetorical question. But I mean, I had read the story of civilization. And I was really intrigued by the idea of having sort of one guide take me through this big story. So I pitched the idea to the publisher, and the publisher just laughed. Nobody would buy that. Nobody's going to publish it. Just forget about it. So I put it aside for a while. But it sat in the back of my head. And I thought about it. I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. But I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm going to do it covertly. I'm not going to say this is volume one in the history of the United States. I'm going to say this is a biography of Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to call it the first American. And I did. And I wrote that book. And then I wrote about Andrew Jackson. And I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my publisher that there was any connection between the Franklin book and the Jackson book. I knew <laughs> there was this link because Jackson was 13 years old, starting to do adult things in 1790 when Franklin died. And this was the overlap that I wanted. And there was something else. I didn't call them histories. I called them biographies. And this because, as I say, I used to teach high school. And I teach freshmen every year now at the University of Texas. And I know that a lot of people had unhappy experiences with their high school history classes. They remember it as there were a column of dates over here and a column of events over here, and you had to match the two. <laughs> and I have observed that all sorts of people, maybe this is more true in Texas than elsewhere, but it's not unique to Texas by any means. All sorts of people cannot remember the last name of their high school history teacher. But they're pretty sure the first name was Coach. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have been in high school. And I know that there is this supposition that you can't just dragoon in somebody to teach math. You have to have some expertise in math, but anybody can teach history. Let's get the football coach, the volleyball coach, whoever it might be. And when I, if I would talk to people about, you know, I'm writing a history of this or that, I didn't have to talk very long before the eyes would start to glaze over. And they're thinking back, oh, God. But if I said I'm writing about a person, People like to hear about, like to read about people. I just say that biography, I think, is the genre of nonfiction that is closest to the novel. Because the novel is all about getting inside the head of the protagonist or the main characters, trying to see the world from their point of view. 
And with biographies, this is what we can do. And part of it was uh, I was at a stage in my life where my elder kids were about to go off to college, and I thought maybe I could sell a few books. Um, <laughs> so uh, after I think it was after I'd written four of the books, four out of six, that I told my publisher that this was the grand project. And actually, I will plug my own book. Actually, <laughs> well, you should. Except it's, it's not going to come out for a while. Uh, but I've written, so five out of the six volumes. Well, the first one's about Benjamin Franklin, then about Andrew Jackson. Uh, the third one, which was written out of order, is about Ulysses Grant, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Okay? The last one, which has to pick up from when uh, Roosevelt died in 1945, and I wanted to carry it as far up toward the present as possible. Any guesses on who it is? Reagan. Reagan. That's it. Very good. Okay. I can see you're dying for the book to be published. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's take some questions from the audience now. I'm sure, I'm sure you have them. We'd, we'd be delighted to hear them. I hope I said some things that were sufficiently <laughs> provocative that you're outraged and need to rebut. Yes? About a year ago, there was uh, a gentleman here who was, had written a book about the president. I can't remember who it was, but he had been a journalist for the National Review. And, uh, uh, so, and then the question came up also in some of the discussion about Bill O'Reilly's books on killing various people. Uh, <laughs> so the question is, historian versus a journalist, uh, either way, how your own political views and so forth might color your, what you write. You know, do you tend to be a revisionist in some sense according to what your, your current uh, political leanings might be? Uh, thanks for the question. In fact, I'm going to answer two parts. If it's part about um, the journalist, say, as against the historian writing biographies, I'm going to at least interpret your question that way, and then the one about my own political views. I've read enough biographies, and I've done biography enough to know that I'm pretty sure that I can tell you whether this biographer is a journalist or a historian, even if you don't tell me the name of the biographer, um, even if I don't know anything about the background. I, first of all, I will say the biographers tend to come from one of these two directions. They're either historians or they're journalists. And I'm going to tell you that my observation is this. The journalists tend to, well, they do the the literary equivalent of the cinematographer's tight focus. So the, the individual fills the frame the whole time. And you never get very far from this particular individual. Because journalists, well, they're in the first place, um, and this I don't hold this against them at all, they're not trained in history, but they also tend to look at these things through the eyes of individuals. Now historians, we're sort of brought up in history. And even though we don't always write directly on these, we are certainly aware of larger issues, of institutions, of broad trends. Every biography is a life and times. And I would say, generally speaking, the journalists stick closer to the life, whereas the historians give more of the life and times. And from what I've told you about the genesis of this series of biographies that I'm doing, you perhaps won't be surprised to know that there is a lot of context here. There's a lot more context in my biographies than there would be in a journalist writing about this, the same figures. Then the second question, the one about my political views and how they influence my writing. And I'm going to add in my teaching. And the reason I say this is that I consider my writing to be, my books to be an extension of my classroom. Well, in fact, I had a very nice discussion with some of your graduate students at lunch today. And I was advising them that they need to be very careful. We all need to pay attention, all of us who write, need to pay attention to who we are writing for. And when they're writing their dissertations, when they're writing their first book, they're trying to get a job and trying to get tenure, it's important to know that their primary audience is an audience of specialists, people who know this stuff probably as well as they do. And so, they need to keep that in mind. And they need to bring to the table something new. Now, I have been, as I've told you, I teach undergraduates. I teach these freshmen and sophomores. I write for, in the early part of my career, I wrote for these specialists until I got tenure. Then you get to write whatever you want. And I decided I wanted to write for a more general audience. And so with this group, it's, it's sort of the same thing that I do in my lectures. But now, as to the question of my political leanings, my students are all eager to know what my politics are. 
And I think they want to know, because if they know, then maybe they can give me the answer I'm looking for on the test, and they'll get a better grade. Now, for this tactical reason, I refuse to tell them. But I'd say, for me, it's an even deeper philosophical, I guess I could call it pedagogical, but philosophical reason. And that is that I want my teaching and my writing to be of equal value to people who disagree entirely with each other. So I wrote a book on Franklin Roosevelt. It was called Traitor to His Class. It is called. You can still buy it. It's in bookstores near you. Um, <laughs> it's, called, it's called Traitor to His Class. Now, I'm just going to ask you, if you heard that title, would you think that Brands gives Roosevelt a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Traitor to his class. Thumbs up? How many thumbs up? How many thumbs down? OK. I'm going to share with you an amusing experience I had. I don't know how many of you know about Hillsdale College. Any of you know about Hillsdale College? It, it would be called a liberal arts college. It's the size and structure of a liberal arts college, but it doesn't like liberalism at all. It's an avowedly conservative arts college. <laughs> and in the year my book came out, Hillsdale College was putting together a symposium demonstrating how the New Deal was the first step down that steep and slippery slope to American socialism. And some one of the organizers of the conference, apparently on a day when they were hurried, um, looked and they saw that this Brands guy has a book out on FDR with traitor in the title. We got to get him to give the keynote. <laughs> so they invited me up. And I accepted the invitation. And I've always loved being the skunk at the garden <laughs> because you know, those of us who are in the teaching business, we know what we call a teachable moment. When you've got their attention, you know, what's he going to say? Well, so here was you know, Daniel in the lion's den, sort of. I had a great time. But I tell my students, and, and in fact, I will tell you that the book, my book on Roosevelt, I like to think of it as neither pro-Roosevelt nor anti-Roosevelt. And in fact, here's what I say in the book. I don't say it in quite these words, but I say that the New Deal was a big deal. I don't say whether it was a good deal or a bad deal. And this because, in the first place, I personally don't think it is the task of the historian, and even more the teacher, to, I will I'll certainly say it's not the, the job of the teacher to impose political views on students, but I would go even so far as to say, it's not the job of the teacher to share his or her political views with the students because given the disparity in power and authority between teachers and students, it comes pretty close to imposing on the students. I also like to think that my students are intelligent enough to make up their own decisions. And I like to think, and this is what I'm aiming for, and I certainly don't claim to achieve it every time, but what I'm aiming for is a book, or for that matter, a lecture, that is of equal value to people who have entirely different politics. When my students ask, what are your politics? And rarely is somebody quite so bold as to ask that. But when they do, I say, I'm a member of the contrarian party. <laughs> and here is my function. My function is to challenge your views. If you come into my classroom a conservative, then I will be a flaming liberal. If you come in a liberal, I will be a rock-bound conservative. Because, and I tell them this explicitly, I don't care at all what you come out of my classroom thinking. I don't care what you think. I do care how you think. I want you to think skeptically. You can land anywhere you want on the political spectrum. But you better be thoughtful in landing there. You better be skeptical. If you don't want to have your views challenged, don't go to college. Or at least, don't come to my classroom. Amen. Let's get another question. Yeah. You mm. talked about Jackson, but you haven't mentioned Indian removal at all. So what, what was behind his passion for Indian removal? Was it pro, I mean, was it, was it racial? Was it economic? Did he have something against the Indians? Where'd that come from? I'm glad you raised the question of Indian removal because I, I used to teach high school. I'm in regular contact with people who still teach high school and even elementary school. I do teacher workshops for various groups in Texas. And I ask them what their students know 
about various historical figures. And if I ask them what they know and what their students know about Andrew Jackson, I get every time a single three-word answer. Do you know what the three words are? Trail of Tears, okay? All about Cherokee removal. And I'm very struck by this fact. I'm struck by the disconnect between the fact that Andrew Jackson, as I've explained, and I hope maybe I persuaded you, that Andrew Jackson was the most popular figure of his time. Jackson was probably the most popular president arguably of the 19th century. And one can say maybe Lincoln, but half the country despised Lincoln. Um, so, so why is, and I'll, I'll give you sort of a really good example, a sort of a, literally a concrete example. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And Portland has a habit of naming its public high schools after presidents. And so there's a Washington High and a Jefferson High School and a Madison and a Monroe. And until the 1960s, there was not an Andrew Jackson High School. But there was a new high school that was built in a neighborhood of the city that had a, a burst of population growth. And in 1968, this high school was built, and it was named Andrew Jackson High School. As late as 1968, Andrew Jackson was sufficiently respectable that the city of Portland would name a high school after Andrew Jackson. Now, I should point out to you that Portland might well be the most liberal city in the country. It's more liberal than San Francisco. It's, I mean, it, in the early days, it was a hotbed of labor radicalism and all this stuff. And it is, it's at the left end of the spectrum. I can guarantee you, and I, because I know, because Portland has built a few more high schools, they would never in a million years anymore name a high school after Andrew Jackson because what is remembered of Jackson is not his contribution to democracy, not his holding the country together, against the secessionist threats of South Carolina. What is remembered of Jackson is his treatment of the Indians. Now, briefly, Jackson's policy on the Indians was, you can either say it was genocidal, or you could say it was realistically far-sighted. Here was Jackson's view. If the Indian tribes wanted to survive, they needed to move west. He, he spoke that as simply a fact of life. And he asked, he said, where, and speaking now in the 1830s, he said, where are the tribes of New England? Where are the tribes of New York? Where are the tribes of Virginia? Where are the tribes of Pennsylvania? Annihilated to a person. And he spoke to the Cherokees, at this time in Georgia. He said, if you stay, if you want to stay, that will be your fate. And he wasn't threatening them with anything. He was just saying, this is the way of the world. Remember, I explained, I tried to, to convince you, that Jackson saw life as a struggle. And as he had been struggling all his life with Indians. And when I was trying, when I, even now, tried to get across to my students, Jackson's view about the Indians, the Indians' view of Jackson, and sort of the relative merits of the argument, I say, OK. As a thought experiment, who's responsible for the hostility between Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East today? Who started this fight? Now, I think you can appreciate that opinions differ violently on this subject. And each side has an argument, we were here first. No, we were before that, we were before that. And I would suggest that Jackson's attitude toward the Indians was much the same. Yeah, we can say, from our distance, that, well, the whites started when they arrived. And all this territory was Indians. But if you lived on the frontier, you didn't go back 200 years. You went back two months to that Indian raid that killed your cousins. And of course, the Indians went back to that raid by whites that killed their cousins. And so the morality of it was largely lost on people on the frontier. It was a struggle. And Jackson took the view that the struggle will continue and it will end with the dissolution, the annihilation of the Indians unless they move to the West. And so, and he said, and if you want to move to the West, we will give you federal help. Now, the Cherokees had their own moral calculus on this. They said, no, no, this is our land. We have a right to be here. They took the case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held in their favor. 
At which point, Jackson is said to have said, Justice Marshall has delivered his opinion. Let him enforce it. Now, this sounds again like a president, at least if you don't like Jackson, as a president out of control. Wait a minute. The Supreme Court has ruled. You've got to fall into line. But for reasons I explained earlier, in Jackson's day, the Supreme Court was not universally accepted as the last word. And Jackson, by the way, he pointed out the Supreme Court's injunction didn't enjoin the President of the United States to do anything. In fact, even if Jackson had wanted to defend the Cherokees in Georgia, he couldn't have done it because there wasn't a federal army to speak of. He would have had to get state militia to do it, or he could have gotten a special appropriations to Congress to raise an army. And Jackson knew perfectly well that there weren't a handful of votes in Congress to raise an army to defend the Cherokees so they could live as a tribe in Georgia. So Jackson's policy was for the good of the Indians and for the good of the United States, they must move. Now, you can say this, and I will agree that to a certain extent it's self-serving. It certainly serves the interests of those people who are greedy after the Indians' territory. But I can't say that Jackson was wrong. Actually, I will tell you something, and you can take this for what it's worth. It's entirely anecdotal. I was doing a book signing after my Jackson book came out, and there was this guy who was standing in line, and he was moving up toward the front, and he didn't have a book. And I thought, this is weird. Why stand in line if you don't want a book signed? But he came up, and when he got to the front, he leaned over close to me, and he looked around kind of suspiciously over his shoulder, and he said, I'm a Cherokee, and I want you to know that I think Andrew Jackson saved my people. And I, I just point out that the Cherokee Nation is thriving in Oklahoma. Now, I'm not, I mean, if you are inclined to condemn Andrew Jackson for his policy, I don't expect this to change your view. But it's, it's a question that comes up all the time. And um, I'll just point out that, like everything in history, if you put the stuff in context, it gets more complicated. Now, That's a good I, note on which to end, and I think we should, we should, we, we need to end there, but let's thank Professor Brands for ah, a very stimulating session.